I had a stockbroker friend that always made twice as much money as me and worked half as hard as I did. So I thought finance was probably a better area for me to be in than manufacturing. I got an MBA from the University of Chicago and then I started looking around for a finance job and my friend introduced me to the CBOE and I went down there and I checked it out and did a little research, and then I decided to try it. I was working at International Harvester, and it looked like they were going broke, and I didn't think I had anything to lose. I got started at the time by buying a Midwest membership. That was a very inexpensive membership that allowed you to trade, I think it was 16 stocks, I think I paid around $6,000 for that membership. And I maintained that for about 18 months. And then I switched to a full membership at the CBOE. The first seat, I paid cash for it. And when I went to the CBOE, I, I leased a seat as opposed to buying one. I didn't have enough money to buy one. Maybe five years later, when I was uh, making some pretty good money, I bought a seat. When I started trading, after about 18 months, I wanted to expand my business. So I hired a clerk to help me trade. And then after a period of time, I set that clerk up to trade. And at the time to do that, you had to have an entity. So I formed Letco so that my clerk could start trading. Well, we then both had clerks and we set them up to trade and then we had a business going. At the end, we had probably 75 traders and 150 employees and these other 75 people were support people for the traders. Don Wilson is by far the most successful guy that I'd uh, started in the business. Uh, he was a young man that came to me when he was 20 years old. He just graduated from the University of Chicago. He was the, one of the hardest workers I ever had. And uh, he was just as smart as a whip. I also started John Nigerian. He was the first guy I hired. And uh, you can see him on CNBC. He's on the, around lunchtime on CNBC. It makes you pretty tired. And you have to have really good support shoes. And I found these rock sports shoes were the only shoes that really worked for me, I, where I could stand up on the floor all day and my uh, feet didn't hurt. Um, a lot of people f thought there was a lot of stress and I tried to trade neutral so that I didn't, I, I had to carry positions overnight, but I tried to set it up so that the, my positions look neutral, so I didn't really have that much stress. I was married and I had one child that was around three and we just had a new baby. And uh, well, we just didn't have that much money and it took me a while to actually start making money, maybe at least a year. And it uh, was very stressful and we just didn't have that much money. I did have a couple part-time jobs, but I concentrated on trying to make money on trading. My good friend Irv Kessler was a very big trader and he would go to uh, whatever pit was busy. From my own personal experience, there were two traders in my pit, which was Revlon, that I thought looked like they really knew what they were doing, and I tried to emulate them in hopes to be successful. 
and uh, I think that did work to a degree. Uh, Ray Meyer is one name, and Kevin Golden, I think, is the other one. Our trading style was basically we just took the other side of customer orders, and uh, that's what you're supposed to do as a market maker, just make a market for the customer and then try to figure out how to hedge it. And uh, that's what we did. We did what the CBOE wanted us to do, and it turns out you can make a lot of money doing that. I was usually a bear, and it's it was because the risk is always on the downside. So that when the stock market goes down, the puts tend to explode. And then when the market goes up, the calls contract. So you can always buy a cheap call when the market's going up. But uh, when the market's going down, it's hard to get puts. So we always traded from the short side. Well, one of the big ones was when we received Telemex, which is the Mexican telephone company. And that turned out to be, I never even heard of the company beforehand. And it turned out to be the biggest trader on the CBOE floor for five years. And we made very tight and deep markets in Telemex. I watched it trade for a while and we committed to uh, doing 250 contracts on our bid and offer. And that was actually unheard of at that time. And then we routinely bought and sold a thousand options on our bid and offer. It was a very exciting time when NAFTA came about. I could tell you the exact minute when NAFTA was decided or passed because the order flow changed dramatically at that time. When we bet, we usually bet on volatility, and uh, we had a big bet on it, and it was actually in Telemex. <clears throat> and then there was a, uh, an instance that went against us. It had something to do with Barclays Bank, and uh, I think there was a rogue trader and uh, sent the stock market way down, and the premium expanded. And our clearing firm wanted us to take our positions off because they felt that we had too much risk. And we basically just argued with them and then everything kind of turned around and went our way. Uh, I'll tell you about one experience we had in our specialist post on the American Stock Exchange. Yahoo was going in the S&P 500 and uh, we had other stocks that went in the S&P 500 and there were all these little plays that you could make to make a little bit of money. Well, it turns out these little plays turned into big plays in Yahoo because Yahoo would swing like 50 points in a day where most stocks wouldn't swing a point. And uh, we had a couple of bets on that we just made a lot of money on at Yahoo. Was in home federal savings where uh, in the morning I looked at the graph of our positions and I said, well, this doesn't look good because we had a lot of risk on. And it turns out there was something going on in home federal savings that we didn't know about. And the stock market crashed and home federal savings eventually went under. And uh, we lost a reasonable amount of money in that one. Reagan rally in the early 80s. It just so happened I was on vacation in Michigan when this happened. I felt I had to go back to the trading floor because I'd been trading for around a year and there was really no volatility and all of a sudden there was volatility and I felt I had to go back and take advantage of what was going on. At the time, or before that, you would try to trade to make a couple dollars. And during this period of time in the Reagan rally, you could make $25 on trades. So it, the trading just changed dramatically overnight. When I first went down to the CBOE, I was looking for a book to read or somebody to teach me about options. 
and there just weren't that many books around and there weren't that many teachers of options. And I finally found a course at First Options that Marty O'Connell taught traders. And I took the course, then I, I looked at the tapes. So I took the course like three different times and that was my background for trading options. In the 87 crash, we were involved with an automatic execution system. It was called the Ray system at the CBO, and it was for OEX options. And right on the close, we sold 40 puts. That was four trades of 10 lots. And we didn't get a, a chance to hedge them or get out of them. And then uh, on Monday, the market opened up down 500 points. I think we lost $400,000 on those 40 lots. Tried to be nice to the brokers. Uh, it was kind of uh, amazing. The brokers would carry customer orders into the pit, and a lot of the traders would belittle the brokers as they carried orders into the pits. I tried to be nice to the brokers, and I think that worked to a degree. Oh, they thought maybe some upstairs trader had screwed them uh, on some trade, and the poor broker that's carrying the order in here took the brunt of that. In the 87 crash, I had several friends that lost a lot of money, and a couple went broke, and then other people then helped them out. By And my good friend John Stafford loaned one guy I think $5 million to get him started again. That was by far the best deed I'd seen on a trading floor. I'd always believed in the golden rule. That's do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I practiced that on the trading floor. And I think it worked big time. I would say Marty O'Connell, who I took uh, the trading course from, was a mentor. We actually hired him and his firm later on to help uh, individual traders with their trading. And uh, he was a good mentor for people in my trading business. I participated in many uh, parts of the exchange governing process. I was on many committees. I was on the finance committee for probably 10 years. And I served on the board of directors for three years. We didn't really pay attention to electronic trading. Um, that was one of the reasons why we exited the business in uh, 2002 than when we did that. Uh, we just saw the floor trading basically kind of going away eventually. And it was, a, I was always amazed at how long the floor trading lasted. Uh, when it looked like electronic trading was just so much better than floor trading. I started out as an independent trader, and then I had a business going, and the business just kept on getting bigger as we hired more traders, and we went into different areas, and uh, we needed somebody to manage the business, and the partners I had at the time didn't really want to manage the business, they wanted to trade, so I was the only one that could really be manage the business and be an administrator. So that's what I did for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm.